Hello everyone and welcome to another Watch Me Do Math video. Today's video is going to be on Lanchester's Laws, which is um, a set of differential equations set up by this, I'm fairly certain he was a military tactician in World War One, that were used to describe uh, modern warfare essentially. And it was a mathematical model of the size of two opposing forces over time as they whittled down the size of the enemy force with four things, four important values to keep in mind. So, suppose you had a force A and a force B, and these two forces were in combat. Now, two differential equations could be gotten out of this. The first thing is that he proposed that the size of these forces, A and B, because it was World War One and there were very, very large numbers of people involved, could be modeled uh, pretty much as continuous values, not discrete values as implied by the fact that it was individual people or vehicles or units taking part in these battles rather than like decimals of people, right? But because the granularity of the number of people involved in the combat with respect to time was very low as the loss of one person is a sort of minute change in the size of a very large army these values were taken to sort of be continuous the second two values after taking into account that these two values represent the size of the forces with respect to time, the second two values are about the power of the two opposing forces. Um, and these were coefficients like alpha and beta. They were constant, they were properties of the type of army. So suppose I'm looking at this situation in StarCraft where there is some player with a few units that are very heavily upgraded and another player with many units that are not so heavily upgraded and note that this is not a good model for games of StarCraft, especially in the case where there are only a few units involved. I'm just trying to prove a point here in, in a way that does not relate to current world politics or any sort of historical event. If this person has a certain, a certain size of army and this person has a certain size of army, those are the values AT and BT. They're properties of the army that change over time. They're not actually properties of what composes the army. But these coefficients, alpha and beta, or the power of the units within each of these armies, represented the number of opposing units per unit time that an individual member of a particular army could destroy. So, this coefficient alpha is a property of the type of unit involved. And suppose that this guy's army is made up of more weaker units, the value of beta, the coefficient of their power, would be less than the coefficient of the power of the units here, alpha. Right, so. Now that that's sorted, I want to just give a little few more examples such that the point goes across correctly. For instance, taking this army of four, four stalkers, and where each individual unit, each individual stalker, has a power alpha, or decreases the size of the opposing force by alpha units every second or every unit time, the entire army will decrease or destroy four alpha units of the opposing army every second. And this army will destroy nine beta units of the opposing army every second, where four and nine represent the number of units remaining, respectively. Now, of course, again, I emphasize that Lanchester's Laws is not a good model for something with such small numbers of units, but I just wanted to get the illustrations going and keep the topic quite visually interesting. So. 
what was the significance of Lanchester's laws? Like, what findings did it present? Because in World War I, people were, um, in terms of their knowledge of military tactics and strategy, a hundred years behind where we are now, by definition, um, they were still, well, like, they, they weren't still working basic things out, but something that was new to them was this idea of modern warfare where people could come into contact with one another not in sort of like sword to sword, shield to shield, cavalry to cavalry where the conflict is only along sort of the the line of contact between two opposing forces like in the olden days in history or medieval warfare the all of the casualties would be happening here, where the two forces contacted one another. Something that was new in World War I was the fact that every single member of a certain force could fire into the ranks of every single member of an opposing force and vice versa. Every single one, every single person was involved, especially when you consider that World War I took place in a scenario where the surface area of two armies attacking one another was maximized by the fact that they were probably in opposing trenches, and by definition, there was only a line of contact of people um, fighting one another. So, because of that, and because of the fact that this new kind of warfare was based on the firing of bullets sort of at random and in very, very large numbers, um, it was because of this that he thought a continuous rate of decreasing the opposing force would be an appropriate model because firing so many bullets at so many people is going to have... I'm not really sure how to phrase this, but again, the granularity will be very low, the resolution will be very high if you were to zoom in on that sort of graph of um, the size of the opposing force over time because the number of people are being eliminated from combat per second would be a large enough number such that statistical variation would not uh, play a huge role in influencing the outcome of the battle. And a great enough number of people were being eliminated from the opposing forces' ability to fight per second that a continuous decline in that number of people would be appropriate. So it's, it's sort of like if people, okay, never mind. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna ditch that analogy for now. But it's it's a bit of a difficult concept to get across. So I hope I've done a good job of that. One thing that we're going to do now is look at this mathematically. I've discussed at great length the actual details of the model and so the assumptions he made and the applications he used. But we're actually gonna go through this mathematically and derive a few of the things that he realized about World War I style battles, or in this case, StarCraft style battles, where usually, but not always, the forces are able to fire into each other, um, like every single member of every single army is participating. Um, that, that's something I'm not absolutely sure on, but this is a maths video, not a StarCraft video, so maybe another time. So, going back to the basis of the model, the for every increment time, a certain number, alpha, of the B's army would be destroyed by each individual unit of A's army. So if you multiply by the number of units in A's army, you get the decrease in the size of B's army over that increment of time. And this logic applies in the opposite direction as well. In a certain increment of time, each unit of B's army is able to destroy or eliminate from combat beta units of A's army. So if we multiply by the actual number of units in B's army, we get the total uh, elimination or destruction of the size of A's army in terms of the number of people in B's army, the power of 
the people in B's army to eliminate those in A's army and the increment of time over which we're measuring. So this is equal to the slight decrease in A's army over time, over that increment of time dt. So you may recognize, because we have two infinitesimal terms, we can put this in terms of a differential equation. And the actual model that Lanchester came up with was uh, beta b is equal to minus dA over dt. And I'm going to omit t for the time being, because we already know that's, that it, it's, it's an input to the functions a and b. So beta b is uh, the negative of the rate of change of a, so it's the rate of decrease of a, and alpha a is the rate of decrease of b. These were the equations he based his work off. All right, so suppose you have these equations. What do you do with them? What useful inferences can you make? Well, these are called coupled differential equations because they are based on one another and re with respect to time. And I don't know much about the sophisticated techniques actually used to solve these equations explicitly for functions in terms of time, but what I do know is how to relate the two quantities to one another if we're looking for certain boundary conditions, such as b is greater than zero when a is equal to zero, or mathematically uh, or in, speaking in English, sum of b remains when a has been completely eliminated. And obviously the model can be made more complex with more equations if you're looking at, for instance, three armies, or if you're looking, for instance, at um, other border conditions where an army might retreat if it's been reduced to half its size, and so on and so forth. So anyway, what do we do here? Well. We're actually going to go back to this form of the equations because I prefer it because it's more logically, um, it's not more logically sound, but it's just, it's more directly based on the real life situation because I was able to tell you in English what the equations meant before putting them in this sort of differential slash rate of change slash gradient form. We have these equations and we want to look at how A is related to B. So, one thing we can do is divide the first equation by the second equation. And in doing so, we eliminate the increment of time, and we're only looking at A in regards to being related to B at a certain values at certain values of A and B. For instance, um, if I move to the side here, alpha A over beta b is equal to db by da. So the number of people in b's army being removed for the number of people in per, per unit of removal of a's army is equal to alpha times a divided by beta times b. And this ratio is useful because it's independent of time, yet we can still integrate it to get um, useful information out of it in terms of what a and b are. So suppose we solve this separable differential equation we, by integrating both sides and we get sort of expressions for a in terms of b and b in terms of a. So multiplying both sides by the change in a's forces and multiplying both sides by that same value we get but, but in terms of beta and b, we get alpha a dA is equal to beta b dB. And if we integrate both sides now, because both of these have constants and functions which are the same as the variable we are integrating with respect to, we get alpha over 2 a squared plus c equals beta over 2 b squared plus c. Or if we want to get rid of that factor of 2, we just say alpha a squared plus alpha a squared equals beta b squared plus c. And this is a rather simple way of expressing what the, different, what the solution to these couple differential equations is. 
So what do we do with this? Alpha a squared equals beta b squared plus c. We still don't know what c is. It's a constant of integration, but it would be nice if we found an actual way to like, get a value. Well, here's the thing about those equations we just solved. They pertain to a certain point in time, not the start. So we haven't actually fed in the starting information to our solution of these equations. That is, we haven't even considered the initial size of A's and B's forces, which is what is actually important to modeling a battle situation. Because there's no point knowing where we are and where we're going to go if we don't know where we started. It's not something we can work out. So, suppose a, a, alpha a squared is equal to beta b squared plus c. And suppose that there is some initial size of a's force, a0, and some initial size of b's force, b0. In other words, at t is equal to 0, we have the situation or the relation alpha a0 squared equals beta b0 squared plus c, which gives us, because all of these things are constants, gives us a value for this constant of integration c. c is equal to alpha a0 squared minus beta b0 squared. In other words, this whole relation here reduces down to a relation between alpha and beta at a particular point in time dependent on the starting sizes of the forces of alpha and beta. Alpha a squared equals beta b squared plus alpha a0 squared minus beta b0 squared, where all of these symbols retain the meaning that I've used previously in this video. So what do we do now? We're like, what, what use can we get out of this? So one thing that would be interesting to look at is how powerful, or sort of this is the question that Lanchester wanted to answer, and it's a big application to Lanchester's laws. Firstly, how powerful does a smaller do the units of a smaller army need to be to defeat a larger army? And secondly, what proportion of a larger army su will survive when it battles down a smaller army? So if I just zoom in here even more to find more space for the math, let's answer the first question first. How powerful does a smaller army army be need to be need to <laughs> how powerful does a smaller army need to be in order to defeat a larger army? So say that A0 is less than B0 because the army B is bigger at the beginning. And we want to find out what is alpha over beta. Or like, how how does the coefficient of power alpha relate to the coefficient of power beta when A wins against B, i.e. when B is 0 and we have a certain value A? So suppose A wins, that means B is 0 and A is greater than 0 because some of A has survived. That means that if we substitute b is equal to 0 into our equation here, alpha a squared equals beta b squared plus a0. Blah. Alpha a squared equals, well, beta b squared goes to 0 because b is 0, equals alpha a0 squared minus beta b0 squared. And again, we want alpha is greater than zero. So, I mean, we want a is greater than zero. We want the the smaller force to be winning. So let's let's try and find an expression in terms of all of these other things for alpha when b is equal to zero. And let's make that greater than zero and solve the inequality and see what we get. So dividing all 
all of the terms by alpha to leave a squared on its own isolated on the left hand side. We get a squared is a zero squared minus beta over alpha b zero squared. And note that beta over alpha is this expression of basically how many times more powerful is army b if it's larger, or what fraction of the power of army a is alpha b, is each unit of alpha b. Is each unit of army B. I'm really tripping over my own words here. If you want to find A, you'll get A0 squared minus beta over alpha B0 squared, or the square root of that. And for A to be greater than 0, then this has to be greater than 0. Otherwise, it's imaginary and the model is sort of meaningless because we know that B can't go into the negative. Neither of them can go into the negative because once you are out of an army, you're out of an army. It doesn't go into negative units. So the model sort of breaks down if we allow imaginary units and we just want to know that A will be greater than zero. So in essence, we're looking for an inequality where A0 squared minus B over alpha B0 squared is greater than zero such that some members of A will survive when B is completely eliminated. So what form does this reduce to? Well I'm just going to let you know that after solving this inequality we can get something in the form A0 over B0 squared must be greater than beta over alpha. What does this actually mean? Well it means that if there is a certain power advantage, or this this actually applies not only to small a and large b, it applies to every case, and it's known as Lanchester's square law. If there is a certain advantage of power by a certain multiplier, then the corresponding disadvantage in numbers needs to be that advantage in power squared in order for an army to lose. So if you zoom out to this particular situation, which I've helpfully drawn with square numbers of units, uh, nine units of army B and four units of army A, if we put those numbers into that inequality, we get that, oh actually, <laughs> this is kind of on me, but it's more the power needs to bleh, bleh, Okay, let's let's put it into the equations anyway. If a0 is 4 and b0 is 9, 4 over 9 squared, 16 over 81, must be greater than beta over alpha. So that means, essentially, these units on the left, the units alpha, have to be more than 5 times more powerful if they are going to win because that corresponds to the square of the number's disadvantage. So ho hopefully that's, that's quite an interesting insight. And another related insight is that you see this square root here? If you put it into the models with various numbers of um, a0, b0, alpha, and beta, Another finding that Lanchester had was that if you have an overwhelming numbers advantage, your losses will get smaller and smaller the larger your numbers advantage is. So if you, if you lost a certain amount of army units delta A, which would be equal to A0 minus this thing, which is essentially what, what amount of units of A are lost. Because you have such a large army in fighting such a small army, then the small army will be destroyed much more quickly than if you had a correspondingly sized army. And Lanchester's insight from this was that um, in situations of deciding whether or not to engage an opposing force, you should only do so if you're only overwhelmingly going to win, generally speaking. 
because then your losses will be very, very minor compared to if you engaged with a comparably sized force. For instance, if, you, if your army was 10 times more powerful, then they would destroy the opposing army 10 times faster, and so you would prevent the opposing army from inflicting 90% of the damage that it would have if you came in with an equally sized army, or something along those lines. So that's like this, this video maybe has been a bit of a train wreck because of my fumbling and saying all of these different variables, but hopefully you found this interesting. This is it's a lesson that applies to uh, strategy games like StarCraft, um, which is where I first discovered this concept of Lanchester's Laws from, um, not as a player of the game, but as someone who watched a few videos on the topic when I was a little younger but didn't understand it fully. It's kind of satisfying to make a video on this now because I still do play StarCraft 2 and these insights like only go in if you're going to overwhelmingly win and uh, numbers are a greater advantage than uh, individual unit power. These, these insights help you play the game and these insights are maybe interesting in other areas of your life as well. And well, like, okay, that's probably like, that's probably exaggeration, but it is an interesting topic to go over, and I hope you've enjoyed the video. Until next time, uh, if you have any requests for videos, then put them in the comments, or email me at watchmedomath at gmail.com. Until next time, see you. See you guys later.